The following interview was conducted with Professor Truman G. Martin for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, March 11th, 2008 at his residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your siblings in early years. I was born in the middle of an oil field in a small town in central Texas called Wortham. And uh, not in the hospital. You were born at home? I was born at home. Okay. Uh, the Depression... Uh, what year were you born in? 28. Okay. Depression uh, caught my father without a job in uh, 20 or oh, in 30, I guess. And uh, apparently they loaded me and my brother, that was a year and a half younger, in an old Essex automobile and toured all of the oil fields in East Texas looking for work and didn't find it. Finally, headed to uh, Gaines County, West Texas, near and near New Mexico, uh, where mother's parents lived on a farm. And uh, we were we were with the grandparents on that farm for maybe two years, I'm not sure. But uh, daddy was not inclined to farm and he wanted to get back in the oil field. And, uh, I gather he had worked in the oil fields. He worked in the oil field from the time he was 14 years old. And uh, quit high school because he got about three weeks into his senior high school, year in high school and found that his pocket was empty and he was accustomed to having money. So he quit high school, worked in the oil field from then on. Uh, and uh, so he went to Beaumont, Texas, where his mother and stepfather were living, and went to work in Spindletop. Now that name probably rings a bell for you. It was one of the big, big oil finds early in the, uh, well, in the 20s. And uh, the company that he had worked for before he uh, became unemployed in Wortham was uh, opening up a, a new oil field in uh, Hardin County where, where we were, were living. And uh, so they, they hired Daddy knowing his record and so forth. And uh, after they brought in the first well, uh, they had to have somebody to take care of it. The pumper, they called him. So, uh, so he became the pumper. And uh, then there were additional wells, and eventually 18 or 20, and I'm not sure. And... Uh, Later, uh, they transferred him to a, uh, a field about 30 miles north of there. And uh, he worked as a pumper in that field until, uh, oh, about the time I was in college. And they made him a supervisor. And uh, he being a supervisor and I being well known, uh, I worked in in the oil field summers while I was going through through college. And where were, where did you go to college? Again? Te Texas A and M. Okay, all right. Your early years, you must have had different schools with your father uh, when you went to grade school and high school. Uh, well, first grade in one three room rural school and the uh, next six grades in another three-room school without moving. They determined that, uh, that this little oil field where we were living was in the other school district. And uh, then af 
after seven years of elementary school, I went to high school in in Silsby, Texas. And uh, no, I didn't move at all. Mm, okay, all right. Uh, Tell us a little bit about what college was like. What was uh, campus life? Campus life. Well, at the time I went, uh, it was uh, immediately after the World War II. There were only about. 2,000 students on campus because it was all male and it was military. So uh, for four years I wore a uniform all the time. In fact, when I graduated from, from, from A&M I did not own either a suit or a sports jacket. Why were you wearing the uniform? Were you an ROTC or? Uh, everybody was required to do two years of ROTC, and most of us elected to take the additional two years and, and earn a commission. So, uh, so yes, I was in ROTC uh, all four years, and. Uh, just like being in the army, mm -hmm. the uh, the students cleaned the dorm, made their own beds, scrubbed the floors. The only employee in the dormitory was one man to go around and empty the garbage. We had no managers of the dormitory. The senior students managed the dormitory, the dormitory life. We're responsible for discipline, etc. And uh, it was quite different. No yeah. girls. Or well, any social events at all? Oh yes, we had we had dances and banquets and so forth. Uh, the girls would be imported from Houston, Austin, Waco, Texas State College for Women, north of Dallas. And, uh, and everybody's hometown. Sure. Uh, I'll take just a moment here. He went to get his yearbook, which I'll look at a little bit afterwards. Uh, okay. Go ahead. <clears throat> what was your course of study there? I majored in agricultural education, and in the senior year when I was doing my student teaching in high school, I taught in two different high schools, three classes in each high school. Uh, I was only 20 years old, big, more or less commanding personality because of the military background. But there were boys in, the, in those vocational ag classes that were 18, 19 years old. And I got a little unsure of my desire to be the disciplinarian, you might say. So I decided, well, I'll go to graduate school. So I applied to seven different graduate schools. And... Uh, LSU offered me an assistantship, which I eventually turned down. North Carolina State said, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give you an assistantship if you can coach the dairy judging team, which I didn't figure I could. And uh, finally, Iowa State came through with an assistantship offer. And... Uh, I uh, I was in the very good graces of the Dean of Agriculture. Uh, his name was Shepherdson. He was an Iowa State graduate. And later was on the uh, uh, Reserve Board for the Federal Had Reserve. A reserve? Board. Yeah, he was he was a member of the and. Uh, so I went over to uh, to Shep's office, as we said, and uh, 
said, I've got, I've got an assistantship at LSU. I have an offer of one at Iowa State. He just looked at me and he said, if you don't go to Iowa State, you're crazy. So, uh, so I went to Iowa State. And, what uh, year did you graduate from Texas A&M? 49. Okay. <clears throat> and um, I was uh, working on a nutrition problem for my master's degree. And after, well, the second summer I was there, Korea broke out. Being a reserve officer, uh, I soon had orders to go to Des Moines for a physical exam and induction. In the meantime, I had met a beautiful young lady, and uh, she was graduating, and uh, somehow we decided that uh, we would get married on, you might say, nothing. <laughs> My Neither of us had a car. My assistantship was $100 a month. Her lab assistant technician job was 75 cents an hour. But we got married. <laughs> we can do it. <laughs> and um, after, well, in the summer of uh, 51, I, was, I went on active duty in the Army. First at uh, the uh, Brooklyn Army Base in Brooklyn, New York. We lived a month in Brooklyn, and uh, I walked from the apartment to the pier where, where, where my office was, and then they sent me to Fort Eustis, Virginia, down near Newport News to attend a 16-week training course. So we moved to Newport News for four months. And uh, after close to six months on active duty, we had enough money that we could buy a 1941 Buick. So we had wheels. Uh, after my course was over, I went back to New York. They assigned me to the uh, Brooklyn Army Base not Brooklyn, uh, Staten Island piers of the New York Port of Embarkation. Now, Port of Embarkation is associated with shipping supplies and personnel to the areas where, where they have combat activities or whatever. Uh, after I'd been on Staten Island less than a month, I had orders to uh, report to uh, San Francisco to be shipped overseas to the Far East. Uh, I went home from the from the pier uh, one day uh, and uh, told Marge. I said, "Well, I have news for you." Surprise! Where we're I'm going to uh, Korea. She says I have news for you. I have a surprise. I went to the doctor today, and I'm pregnant. <laughs> so uh, she went to San Francisco with me and came back. Ames worked in the lab of the animal science department there. Uh, Is that where she was from originally? Well, she was from Iowa, okay, about sixty miles north, mm -hmm. northwest, northeast. That was her home, in other words, that state. Yeah, that that was her home state. 
and uh, and of course that's where we had lived the first four months we were married six months and uh, so I did get shipped to Korea I spent spent two nights in an army base in near Tokyo Japan and then by ship around to Incheon and uh, then down to the southern end of Korea, Pusan. And uh, I worked there uh, about seven months as what they call a peer officer, supervising the loading and unloading of uh, ships with uh, uh, military supplies and food relief items for the Koreans and uh, whatever they had had to come in. Uh, then, uh, then I spent another seven months in the uh, cargo planning office as the uh, chief aide to, to a colonel and planning all of the uh, cargo loads that were shipped out and in planning that you have to be sure you get the front back balanced and, and the loads that come off first on top is one thing or another and uh, so I did that for seven months came home and uh, was released from active duty went back to Iowa State now, after Korea, I have, was eligible for the GI Bill. My assistantship had been changed from 100 a month to 150. And uh, I had a nine-month-old son that I had not seen prior to that time. So uh, we moved into the married student uh, housing there at, uh, at Ames it was was named Pamel Court after some administrator at Iowa State but the students called it Pablum Court and uh, when my parents visited us while we were there daddy was a little hesitant and so forth he got me off alone and he says Truman I have never seen so many babies and pregnant women in one place in my life. <laughs> <coughs> Understand. But um, I, uh, as I, as I was finishing my degree, I had interviewed uh, several several places. Clemson being one of them, and they had offered me a job and actually had faculty housing arranged for me and so forth. And uh, when I finished the degree, I sent a telegram saying, I'm ready, we we're expecting another child in January, would like to get moved and so forth. And uh, word came back that the USDA money they had been counting on to pay my salary was not available, so there was no job. So all of a sudden, I was left up in the air. Well, everybody around the department went to work, and the one fellow says, well, they were looking for somebody at Kansas State a few years ago, a couple of years ago, and I don't think they ever filled it. So, uh, so I contacted Kansas State. They said the University of Maryland also was looking for somebody. And uh, so I contacted the head of the department at the University of Maryland. And uh, one of the former graduate students who was about to go to work as chief 
statistician for the ARS in, uh, in Beltsville, Maryland, came through and uh, he says, <coughs> said, if you can get your GS rating in statistics, I've got a job for you. And uh, somebody else attended the regional dairy cattle breeding meeting and came back and says, Purdue has just opened up a, a job in dairy cattle breeding. So I was submitted for that and uh, probably no more than five or six weeks after I got word that I didn't wasn't going to Clemson, I interviewed in Chicago at the animal science meetings and then in the early uh, or, or in mid-December I came over and spent a day here and they made an offer uh, that uh, was as good as I was going to get and uh, I accepted. I went to work here at Purdue on February the 1st, 1955. Okay. What about housing? How was that? Did they do it? You mean here? Mm -hmm. Well, a, an associate professor in the dairy department was moving out of one of the experimental houses out on David Ross Road, which is now where the fraternities are. And uh, so my department head called and arranged for us to have that house. So we waited about three weeks and he moved out. I went out to Ames, rented a trailer, loaded it, came back and, and we moved into that house. And uh, the situation was supposed to be that we should not expect to live there longer than one year. Though there were people there who had been there two or three years. And, was it uh, considered temporary until you could find something? Or? Yeah. So we started looking and uh, when, we, when we arrived here, I've, I've often said I had a PhD, a 14-year-old automobile, a wife, three babies. The oldest was not yet two, it was only two and a half. And the youngest was six weeks and $500. And I wasn't going to get paid till the end of February. So after we'd been here a month or two, and uh, the paychecks were coming in and uh, all of a sudden I said, Marge, it doesn't seem like we have any more money here than, than we had at Ames, though presumably our income is uh, about 60% greater. And uh, so I sat down and I pushed my pencil and sure enough, by the time you took in what was being withheld from the paycheck, the difference in rent uh, and all of the different things, we had moved at a $25 reduction. And that was a starting salary of $6,000 a year when, where I had 310 tax-free at Iowa State. Uh, but as far as what we had to spend for uh, whatever we wanted, we had taken a $25 a month cut. Uh, the 1st of July, Professor Gregory, who was then the head of the dairy department, uh, gave me a $25 a month raise, and uh, so I figured I was even. Uh, and uh, my job was job assignment was to do research in dairy cattle breeding and to teach a course in dairy cattle breeding. Uh, 
I taught my first course spring semester of 55. And uh, worked for a number of years just on the dairy cattle breeding projects. And uh, I was uh, named, second year I was here, I was named chairman of the Ag School Curriculum Committee. Now, you, can you imagine a new assistant professor in that position? And uh, we worked on a lot of things like what are the requirements for graduation? Uh, what uh, what's, what should we have? Well, first we found that the number, that the different curricula in the College of Ag Agriculture varied in requirements from about 134 credits to 156. And uh, so we thought, well, something needs to be done about that. Guess uh, for openers. You know, secondly, uh, there was no requirement for what you might call liberal arts courses. They required English, speech, but no requirement for a history course or whatever. So we said, well, we, we need to do that. So this committee put together uh, a, a large number of recommendations. And uh, Harry Reid retired as dean at the end of my first year as chairman of that committee. And Earl Butts came in. Well, Earl called me over and says, Truman, what do we do about this curriculum committee? And I said, well, as far as I'm concerned, we have a study of what should be in the Ag School curriculum going. We have a lot of uh, replies from students, uh, former students, employers, faculty, and I'm in the process of doing some statistical analysis on it. And I would like to have you just rename the committee and let us finish the job. So Earl renamed the committee and uh, we finished the job. What did he rename it to? Oh, it, it, it just, he just named us as members. Continue, it continued that. Continue, just continue. Okay. And uh, so we, we came up with a number of proposals. And uh, one thing that came out of it that was not necessarily intended was that uh, the dairy department, the poultry department, and the animal husbandry department would be combined into one, animal sciences. Uh, the introductory course would not be one in dairy, one in et cetera, it would be across all. The animal breeding course would be cover all species and I would teach it. Uh, the uh, number of credits required was standardized at 136. A couple of departments really raised cane about that. And I think we put in a requirement of 12 credits of uh, liberal arts courses. That could be foreign language, history, whatever. Uh, that was the first core requirement in agriculture. Now it has been modified many times since. But this not, was the beginning. And not many people remember where it started. Good. I was going to ask you about that uh, union because it came around in the 60s and uh, you just addressed that because as a result of, that was one of the things that came out of the curriculum study. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, of course in addition to that Professor Gregory, head of dairy, was approaching 70 and was going to have to retire. Uh, Claude Harper, 
head of animal husbandry was about a year younger and was approaching retirement. J. Holmes Martin, head of poultry, was about four or five years younger, but he favored combining because of some of the economies that could be gained. And uh, both personnel and, and uh, supplies, laboratories, etc. He could see it. <clears throat> so uh, Fred Andrews, okay, when, when Howard Gregory retired, Fred Andrews was moved from animal husbandry professor to head of the dairy department. So he was my department head for a year and a half before the combination of the departments. And then when they were combined, Fred was the head of the combined departments, which was named Animal Sciences. And uh, J. Holmes Martin became associate head. And uh, J. Holmes took a uh, terminal sabbatical leave for six months and uh, they just pulled the, the three departments together. Well, this resulted in a lot of uh, courses that went across all species. Uh, more of the nutrition, physiology, and so forth, and certainly the, the genetics was just across all species and uh, so I probably taught that animal breeding course 30, 40, 50 times, I'm not sure, I'd have to count it up. And uh, when one of the professors who had taught uh, general animal husbandry and had coached the livestock judging team for years, uh, retired. I was asked if I would take over this general sophomore level course. And I thought about it and I said, well, I will under my terms. And my terms were that uh, instead of it being sheep, beef, cattle, and swine. It would also include something on poultry, dairy, and horses. And uh, would be not only uh, about the breeds and of livestock, but the market classes. In other words, how do you, how do you say that a, an animal is likely to produce a choice carcass or or whatever, and uh, and the laboratories would be pointed toward selection of breeding stock rather than uh, appraising the beauty of the animals and, uh, and and ranking a class of four. Uh, I had a large number of different research experiments. The one that was going when I came here was a crossbreeding experiment involving Red Danish, Milking Shorthorn, and Red Pole dual purpose cattle. Uh, I worked on that project for probably uh, 12 or more years. Uh, as that one uh, played out, we uh, were more concerned with how would the Red Danish work with Holstein. So we designed a, a project to do a crossbreeding study of Red Danish and Holstein. And I, that project went uh, about seven years. In the meantime, the uh, 
uh, man who had been in charge of beef cattle breeding was given other assignments and I was assigned the beef cattle breeding work as well as the dairy cattle breeding. And the, uh, the Angus herd out at the Shola Purdue farm near Green Hill was my research herd. So uh, for 23 years, we selected that herd for large weight at one year of age and were able to, to change the genetic merit by about uh, 12 pounds an animal over over that period of time. time. And uh, uh, and this, this led to uh, some other questions. We had a, a herd of milking shorthorn cattle at uh, the Felden Purdue farm at Bedford. And uh, somebody says, well, what can we do with them? Well, Holly Parlberg, John Hodges, who was at the Felden farm and I sat down and we said, well, let's, let's do a crossbreeding study of the milking shorthorn and the Angus. So we set that up and, uh, and it went for 12 years or so. I mean, these are all long-term projects. Yes, I understand. <clears throat> uh, Fred Andrews and John Christian and, and uh, pharmacy had uh, obtained a uh, uh, health grant to study the body composition of animals, fat, lean content, using the uh, uh, the counter that was set up in bionucleonics. And what we were, what we were, what we were doing was counting the uh, naturally occurring potassium, which was uh, potassium is intracellular in the lean and if an animal has a high content of potassium then it has it's 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 a a lean animal rather than being fat and this was being we compared this with a number of measure, other measures of body composition but uh, this went over eight nine years and uh, we pro probably spent about a million dollars of federal funds. <laughs> uh, now, in, in all of this, I had 20-some-odd uh, graduate students. I had 23, I believe, masters and uh, 10 PhDs. And I, uh, let's see. I wanted to, uh, I'd always wanted to travel. So in the 70s, I decided, well, I'm kind of stuck here. Things are static. I applied for about three or four administrative jobs. I was, I was a runner-up on a couple a bridesmaid, you might say, and finally decided, well, I'm tired of chasing resumes and interviewing and so forth. Let's just take a sabbatical. 
So I arranged to uh, go to the Animal Breeding Research Organization in Edinburgh, Scotland for 10 months and took, well, I accumulated two full months of vacation and took uh, eight months off at three quarter pay. And we lived in Edinburgh, Scotland for 10 months. And I did work on uh, a selection project on sheep, published three papers, I think, as a result of that. Uh, <coughs> came back from that, went back to what I was doing before, and uh, well, picked up the two or three projects that were still active. And uh, seven years later, as well, it's time for another sabbatical. So we got things going. I started about two years ahead, and uh, one of one of my former students was now a research scientist in the uh, Spanish equivalent of the A R A R A R S and uh, had a beef cattle project. And he helped me uh, apply for a uh, U.S. Spanish government supported fellowship. A friend in uh, Israel uh, had me uh, apply for a fellowship that they had at uh, Riovat in Israel, and uh, one of the state, southern states in Brazil was looking for somebody to help them set up a PhD program in animal science, and uh, they couldn't, couldn't pay me a salary, but they could uh, provide me with rather liberal living expenses. So I had all of these things working, and I came to about two weeks before I was supposed to leave. We still didn't know where we were going, but uh, the Spanish program came through, and uh, we went we went to Spain, moved into an apartment in Madrid, and uh, a few weeks after we were in Madrid, we got word from Israel that. Uh, well, first Israel said that I was alternate. Got word from Israel that the one they wanted to award it to couldn't, and it was mine if I wanted it. But I was already in Spain, already committed. If I had known that before, I could have gone to Israel and then Spain. She wasn't anxious to go to Israel. But... Uh, uh, so for a year I worked on uh, some beef cattle data in, in, in Spain for research and uh, gave some individual lectures from time to time. Uh, and we came back from, from that uh, sabbatical. And almost immediately, uh, Purdue had a program in Portugal where they were helping Portugal set up some uh, new agricultural colleges. With the loss of Mozambique and Angola, where they had full-fledged ag schools and med uh, veterinary schools, they had inadequate facilities in Portugal itself. So they had to establish some new ones. And Purdue was one of the principal uh, grantees of AID. So we went to uh, Portugal for, what was it, two months the first time? I think it was three. And uh, three months. 
most of the time at Villa Real in the north, but uh, two weeks or so at uh, Evera in the south. Uh, came back from, from that. Well, I taught a course there in uh, uh, both statistics and uh, animal breeding. And uh, came back from that. And a year later, Vic Lechtenberg and I went back to Portugal and did a, a full-fledged course in statistical design and analysis of data at Villarreal. Uh, that was about a month, wasn't it? At least. Yeah. Okay. I don't remember exactly. It was, it was much shorter than the three months before. More like six weeks, I think. Uh, okay. And uh, so came back from that and, and uh, then about a year later, a year and a half, you know, at the University of Evera wanted me to come over and do this same statistics course. So we went to Evera for three or four months. And, uh, and, and this was immediately before our sabbatical in Spain. Now, when, when we finished the sabbatical in Spain, come home, came home, it was right after uh, the U.S. had bombed Tripoli, and uh, the Spanish were, well, everybody was concerned about the security of airlines. And uh, so we got, we got home from, uh, from that trip, Portugal followed by Spain, and uh, some of my colleagues, boy, I'll bet you're glad to be out of there. And I said, well, you know, if you know where to go and what to stay away from, it's probably safer than driving from here to Indianapolis. And uh, I said, well, you, you wouldn't go back, would you? I wasn't, I wasn't back two weeks when I had a call from the USDA wanting me to be part of a team going over to uh, evaluate the Portuguese research program. And uh, so with, uh, with Jules Janik and, uh, and a USDA soils person, we, we went to Portugal for uh, more than a month. Just about, yeah. And uh, went all over. And we lived in Lisbon, basically, for that one. And uh, came back from that and back into my research program and teaching and so forth. And, uh, so in 92, it was time for another sabbatical. At that point, I was 64 years of age about to have to retire. Well, I knew that at that age, they might not grant it unless it was something that they really wanted me to do. So I made arrangements with a long-term friend to go to the University of Kapisvar in Hungary to teach animal breeding and statistics and to help them with some of their research design. And, uh, and in order to help finances, uh, I got a, great, a good description of exactly what I was going to be doing and obtained a 10-month uh, Fulbright. So I had 
six months or a year at half pay from Purdue. I had the Fulbright, uh, the Portuguese University uh, provided some support for housing and transportation. And, uh, and of course, when you spend more than a year abroad, you've got a very big chunk that's not subject to income tax. So that was a real financial coup. <laughs> Uh, but we were we were in Hungary thirteen months. And I was supposed to be there twelve months, but when it was time to come home, they said, "Well, we want you to stay three weeks longer uh, at the uh, faculty convocation that's coming up. We want to present you with an honorary doctorate." So we stayed a month longer, wound up 13 months. And uh, was it the next year we went back? I believe so. And went back for uh, about three months. And then uh, about, two, about three years after that, we went back again. All of, each of these times I was helping their faculty with their statistical analysis and so forth. And in the meantime, I had all of these, or not all of them, but uh, some of these research projects going, graduate students and so forth, and was still teaching uh, a couple of courses a year. Uh, I put in some long hours, but that's about where it where it stacks up. Twelve years ago, I retired, and uh, you were mentioned about grading. Were you you wanted to talk about that, didn't you say? Okay. Initially, he made a comment. <clears throat> When I came to Purdue in 55, they had just recently changed their grading system. From what to what? Well, they had, uh, they had a system where they had an H grade for honors that could only be given to 10% of a class. And they were using a 6.0 index, and the H was 6.5. And an A was 6, and a B was 5, etc., on down the line. Well, about a year or two before I came, they did away with the H. And the... Uh, a large number of the professors in all of the schools at Purdue just immediately made the A the H. And the grade point indexes were horribly, horribly low. Furthermore, the requirements for graduation were rather unique. What, whatever your your uh, curriculum called for, you had to pass all of those courses with at least a D. And you had to obtain 90 quality credits. Now, anything A, B, or C was a quality credit. So if a student's curriculum called for 130 credits, they could have 90 credits of C 
and 40 of D and graduate. So at some point, well, what, what happened is that our good students were applying for graduate school at other places and with these uh, low indexes that were forced because the whole scale went down, some of our best students were being re rejected by substandard southern schools. Something had to be done. So the decision was made that we would go to, uh, uh, well, let's see, 4.0 on the six point scale required for graduation. Well, the first semester that, uh, that that was in effect, the indexes of the graduating seniors in agriculture were such that about 40 of them weren't going to graduate. And it was a little worse than that in engineering and, and humanities. So the faculty senate had to work out something. So they went back and they, they, they started working this, re started, I think they went back to a 3.5 or something of the sort, 3.6 maybe. And they, and, and they started just working it up a, a, a tenth of a point a year until they got it to the four. Uh, in the meantime, people had gotten past the old H and were willing to grant 20% A's if they were earned and so forth. And, uh, and the, the grade points went way, way, went, went way up. But uh, it, I would say it was into the 60s before we got to the, to the point we are now. Mm -hmm. Now eventually they dropped the six back to a four. I never understood the six anyway. <laughs> but, uh, but that was the unique six system immediately before I came and, and after I came. Yeah, okay. Now I was chairman of the curriculum committee at the same time that all of this Grading. Grading changes were taking place. Sure. Okay. Well, now you retire. What were your retirement activities? You want to tell us a little bit about that? Anything special that comes to mind? Well, I have worked on some of my research data. and. Do uh, you still go back to campus? Do you still have? Occasionally. I still have a desk. Uh, but it's, I, I haven't done as much as I should have. But uh, I have written some uh, obits on faculty members who died, some nomination forms on faculty members for awards. Uh, That's nice. And I prepared the uh, animal science document. It got the uh, Hanson Award for animal science for their activity with graduate students. Uh, every so often I have a call and say, hey, hey Truman, will you prepare a document on so and so? Well, I have to go over and dig out something on them and. Uh, but uh, now I got something a couple of days ago, uh, the Gamma Sigma Delta uh, Ag Honorary, where it said that I sent, uh, sent my reply to a faculty member in animal science. I have no idea who he is. 
but uh, oh, that's another thing. I I was we had uh, uh, we had Sigma Xi here, which is research. I was a member of Sigma Xi when I came. Uh, we had uh, what's the Alpha Gamma Rho. But at that time, Alpha Gamma Rho did not admit women. And we were beginning to have a fair number of very good female students in agriculture. Uh, and uh, so I was made a member of Gamma Sigma Delta which is an agricultural honorary at Iowa State. So I said, well, why don't we set up a, a chapter of Gamma Sigma Delta? And uh, so I was a member of the steering committee that, uh, that set that up. And uh, Now this was just after Dean Freeman retired and Rudy Hills took over. Dean Freeman would never have allowed us to do it. He was he was Alpha Gamma Rho all the way. <coughs> uh, but we got that established. I was the first secretary, later president of Gamma Sigma Delta. Uh, I also was president of the uh, Purdue chapter of Sigma Xi at one time. So, have you been? You've been active in the Retirees Association. I have been chairman of. Well, okay, I've been a member of the Trips and Tours Committee for almost ten years. I've been chairman of it all but two of those, and I can't seem to get rid of it. Has that association grown? over time? Uh, well, it grows every time somebody retires because the instant you retire, you're a member. Right. And, uh, but uh, it hasn't grown in terms of getting people to participate, participate actively. Uh, I mean, we, we were trying to get we were trying to get somebody to be chairman of this Trips and Tours Committee starting this next year in uh, June, and they were unable. So I'll be going. I'll be going another year on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, both of us have been very active uh, here at Westminster. She has uh, been secretary of the resident. Council for what? About five years. About five years. And uh, I was just recently elected chairman of the resident council for for uh, Westminster. Mm -hmm. uh, we are both listed as docents at uh, Historic Profits Town. She goes out regularly. I have said I will not go out and shovel manure and this sort of thing. When you have an educational program where you need me, I will, I will go out and help. And, uh, and I've helped with some of the, uh, some of the animal programs. That's good. Yeah. But, uh, so, so that's, taken a fair amount of time. Sure. How about an outstanding event in your life? Something come to mind? <clears throat> outstanding event? Mm -hmm. You have more than one, I'm sure. Or a favorite memory of Purdue? Whichever. Honorary 
Military Doctrine in Hungary was certainly an outstanding event. Good point. Associated with uh, with the Fulbright lectureship before it. Uh, here at Purdue. I'm, I would have to get my... You shared some, I think when they listen to the tape and when they read the transcript, all of those things that you've been involved in, it comes to fore, and I think that's, you know, oh. it. the threads are there, you know, woven into your research, your research career at the university. Well, I, I have a book in here I could pull out and we, yeah. could, we could go through. <laughs> Okay. All of them, but that's okay. Oh, another another outstanding. I've I've been active in Boy Scouts for forty five years. Good. I was Cub Master. Good organization. Scout Master, Explorer Advisor, District Chairman, Council Commissioner, Council Vice President. Uh, and now I'm simply a member of the uh, advisory council. No, no longer actually on the executive council. But uh, 45 years in Boy Scouting. And uh, the highlight of that uh, was probably the uh, Silver Beaver Award for for outstanding leadership. Right. Very good. In closing, any particular comments you do that you'd like to close with? Anything that you'd like to summarize? Can you think of anything? Well, we've roamed all over the place. <laughs> no, I think not. Okay. Also I wanna I want to thank you very much and I also wanted to mention that his wife also sat in on the interview. Thank you, Professor Martin. I appreciate that.